Okay, here's the cast of characters for the class this time. We're going to be hearing more or less about the age of Cosimo de' Medici in Florence today, and that's more or less the first half of the 15th century. Cosimo is going to have his friend Michelazzo rebuild the Dominican Abbey of San Marco in Florence, and Fra Angelico is going to paint frescoes on the walls of the cells of the monks, which we can still see there. And we'll see other things by him as well. We'll also hear about how Brunelleschi was involved in another competition of a sort with his old rival Lorenzo Ghiberti. But this time Brunelleschi's going to win and get the job putting the dome on the Cathedral of Florence. After the break, we'll visit the Palazzo Medici, which Michelazzo built for Cosimo, and see the frescoes in the chapel painted by Benazzo Gazzoli. And we'll also see what's left of the work that Paolo Cello did for the, the palace. The renegade monk and painter Filippo Lippi actually lived in the Palazzo Medici for a while, more or less as a guest of Cosimo, and we'll see some of his work and also hear some more music of more of the music of Guillaume Dufay today and other composers. Uh, Dufay was the most important composer in Italy in the first half of the 15th century. At the end of the last lecture, we were looking at the frescoes by Masaccio in Santa Maria del Carmine, and at just about the same time that those frescoes were painted, this tempera altarpiece by Gentile de Fabriano was made for the Strozzi family chapel in the church of Santa Trinita in Florence. It depicts the procession of the Magi, uh, Epiphany in effect, and it's now in the Uffizi Gallery. This is obviously in a very different style than Masaccio's work. If Masaccio's work is to be described as puro senza ornato, pure without ornament, this is its opposite. Molto, molto ornato. The style represented here is in fact called the international style by art historians. Works are said to be in this style if they were made roughly between the late 14th century and early 15th century and are characterized by an emphasis on detail and decoration. But like most such designations, it's impossible to define this style very precisely. From the Italian perspective, it's a kind of international style, I guess, because this kind of thing is more common in France and Flanders. Here's a closer view of it. There are going to be, of course, a lot of very talented panel painters in 15th century Italy, and Gentili is certainly one of them. But I think one could argue that every great Renaissance painter of that century did his most impressive work in fresco, from Masaccio to Fra Angelico to Piero della Francesca, Leonardo, Raphael, and Michelangelo. On the other hand, north of the Alps, the greatest work is in panel painting, and fresco is hardly a medium used at all. Here's another close-up of Gentili's altarpiece. With the great Italian frescoes, you want to stand back to get the overall effect. With works like this, you want to come right up and look at all the amazing little miniatures, which matter more, really, than the global effect of the composition. Here's one of the scenes in the predella of this altarpiece. A predella is a sort of platform on which the main part of an altarpiece sits. The subject here is the presentation in the temple. Gentili painted this at just about the time Brunelleschi was figuring out one-point perspective. And he doesn't know how to use it, but like many artists, he managed to produce a vaguely 3D scene even without it. His main problem, as far as realism goes, is scale. It's not necessarily the case that you get scale right, even if you make your picture look three-dimensional. Ghiberti gets both the third dimension and the scale right in the east doors, but artists won't begin to consistently do so until the middle of the 15th century. Mm -hmm. 
important people in the arts in 15th century Florence was not an artist at all, but a saint. San Antonino Piarazzi, the prior of San Marco, who became the Archbishop of Florence and who was born where this bust of him is, just south of the Duomo. As Archbishop of Florence, he had the power to influence very greatly what could and could not be done to decorate the churches of the city. And we know of no important artist who was ever told he couldn't do what he wanted. One occasionally hears a lot of loose talk about how artists of this or that age were prevented from painting a great masterpiece by this or that benighted clergyman, but there are very few examples to support this myth. This is the Abbey of San Marco in Florence as it looks today, and Antonino became the prior here in 1439. The facade of the church is 18th century, and the church itself has been altered considerably since the 15th century, but the abbey behind the church is very much as it was in the days of Antonino and Cosimo de' Medici. The story goes that one day, when Cosimo was feeling a twinge of conscience about the ethical implications of some business deal, and it is difficult, I suppose, to become a millionaire without stepping on a few toes, foreclosing on an occasional widow and orphan. Anyway, Cosimo asked his friend the Pope Eugenius IV how he might be able to, as it were, set his account straight with St. Peter, and Eugenius, understanding Cosimo's sort of Wall Street perspective, said he thought that since the Abbey of San Marco in Florence needed a lot of work, Half a million dollars in gold spent on that should balance the books just fine. And just to make sure, Cosimo wound up spending something more like four times that on the work. 40,000 florins, which would be worth over two million dollars in gold today. This is the cloister of San Marco as it looks today. When Cosimo was briefly exiled in 1433, the architect Michelazzo proved his loyalty by going with him. And when Cosimo was able to return a year later and had an architectural commission to throw someone's way, Michelazzo was his man. This is in fact usually said to be the first real Renaissance-style cloister or courtyard built. Brunelleschi's facade for the Ospedale degli Innocenti, the Hospital of the Holy Innocents, which we'll see later is often said to really be the first Renaissance building in the full sense. And what Michelazzo does here is just kind of wrap that facade Brunelleschi built all the way around an open space to create a courtyard or a cloister. The main thing to notice is the absence of anything pointed, anything reminiscent of the Gothic style. As I've said before, the Gothic was often regarded by Italians as a foreign style a style to some extent imposed on them. And by 1400, anything in that style was also, even if treated with respect, like Santa Croce, Santa Maria Novella, and the Cathedral of Florence, uh, also these things were considered, however, to be artistically out of fashion. The pointed Gothic arch was, in fact, rarely used in any secular buildings at all south of the Po. So there are, in fact, a lot of round-arched precedents for what Michelazzo did here in buildings like the Bargello, the Loggia dei Lanzi, and the Palazzo Vecchio in Florence, something which I think a lot of art historians forget. But the claim is that the 15th century colonnades of Brunelleschi and Michelazzo are, in any case, much more graceful and elegant than their 14th century ancestors, and so deserve to be said to be in a different style, the Renaissance style. You can see the Medici balls on the coat of arms at the left, and Cosimo had his own private cell here where he could come to meditate when he was tired of counting his money. And he had Michelazzo also widen what came to be known as the wide street, Via Larga, now Via Cavour, that connected San Marco to the Palazzo Medici a couple of blocks away. This is the library of San Marco now, also designed by Michelazzo as part of his project for the whole monastery complex. People often suppose that those reinforcing bars running through old Italian buildings like this one are the work of insensitive modern restorers, but many of them have been there for 500 years. You'll see some in a minute in a painting by Fra Angelico. 
One of the great bibliomaniacs of the Renaissance was a fellow named Nicolao Nicoli, who went bankrupt pursuing his passion. Cosimo, a fellow book lover, made him a deal which allowed him to continue to buy books using a credit line from the Medici Bank on the understanding that he would will the books to the Medici at his death. I'm not sure Cosimo knew what he was getting into, but Nicolao eventually bought 800 books for a total of $3.2 million. That's an average of $4,000 a book, but the printing press hadn't been invented yet. It is, in fact, sometimes claimed that Nicolao Nicoli invented cursive writing, called italic at the time. And we still, of course, call a kind of cursive print italic. So that copyists, his idea was that copyists could work faster using this italic or cursive script. Nicolao Nicoli's library was put here after his death, and according to his will, it was also open to the public. And it is said to have been the first true public library because of this, but that's a claim that could be argued about, I'm sure. Lorenzo de' Medici eventually moved most of the San Marco Library to the library at San Lorenzo, and many of Nicolao's books are still there. So Michelazzo was hired to rebuild San Marco, and the fellow in charge of what we might call the interior decoration was himself a Dominican monk in residence there, Giovanni da Fiesoli, known as Fra Angelico. This is one of his earliest surviving works, the altarpiece for the Abbey of San Domenico at Fiesoli, where it still is. He apparently studied painting before becoming a Dominican, but it's not thought that anything survives from his days as a layman. And by about 1420 when this was done, he had entered the Dominican order. This is the kind of format which came to be known as the Sacra Conversazione, or sacred conversation, even though no one is saying anything. It also is referred to more sensibly as the Madonna and Child with Saints, and this is one of the earliest examples of this format, which replaced the old 14th century Madonna enthroned format. Giotto and Cimabue had painted the Virgin as a kind of divinity approached only by angels, and here she's more like a queen with her court of saints, the nobility of heaven. Here's the Virgin up closer. One could argue that there is some of both Gentili and Masaccio in Fra Angelico. His panel pictures are full of beautiful details, like those of painters who work in the international style, but without quite the same devotion to material things like gold and jewels usually that might have been thought out of place in a Dominican setting. It's perhaps then the influence of Masaccio's puro senza ornato style that wins out, and like Masaccio and those 15th century painters of genius to come, Fra Angelico does do his greatest work in fresco. By the time the abbey was under construction in the late 1430s, Fra Angelico was working on various panel painting projects here, and about 1440 he was commissioned to decorate the cells of the monks with frescoes. And this is the Annunciation, which is at the top of the staircase that leads up to the second floor of the abbey, where the cells of the monks are. It is, in fact, on the outside wall of what was Prior Antonino's own cell, Panel paintings are, of course, very easy to move from the place for which they were intended. Frescoes can be moved, but most of the great Renaissance frescoes are still right where they were painted, like these by Fra Angelico at San Marco, and that does add a lot to their evocative power. Notice those iron reinforcing rods again. He could have left those out. He's a painter. Here's the Virgin up closer. Her reaction in Fra Angelico's picture now is certainly more appropriate than that of the last Virgin Annunciate we saw. <laughs> 
The very first one in an altarpiece, remember, the one with the very offended expression painted by Simone Martini uh, about a hundred years earlier, back about 1320. Submissive to the will of God is, I think, the way to describe Mary here. Of course, for someone like Fra Angelico and his fellow Dominicans, this was not just, as it were, a beautiful work of art, but something of a kind of, with a kind of spiritual significance, which gave it a kind of second-order status, not easy for most of us today to grasp. It is important, in fact, to remember that very few things we've seen so far have been meant to be works of art in the usual modern sense. Almost all the things we've seen have had some spiritual or political or other significance that made them more important than, as it were, mere works of art would be. To the end, then, of creating a deeper spiritual atmosphere in the monastery, Fra Angelico, as I said, painted frescoes on the walls of the monks' cells, and we're going to see some more of these now. This is the one inside Prior Antonino's cell. It depicts the episode in the apocryphal Gospel of Nicodemus and the Golden Legend, in which Christ frees the souls of the Old Testament heroes from limbo during the period between Good Friday and Easter, and you can see the devil there squished under the door. There are 44 cells at San Marco, and Fra Angelico painted the pictures in about 20. And while we see some representative samples of his work in these cells, we're going to hear Guillaume Dufay's setting of the sequence for Pentecost. It's the hymn Veni Sancti Spiritus, the text of which is usually attributed either to Pope Innocent III or to the Englishman Stephen Langton. This is Fra Angelico's own cell with the entombment of Christ and Saint Dominic, the founder and patron saint, of course, of the Dominican order at the left. This is the Last Supper, and Fra Angelico's solution to the halo problem is just to leave the stools on this side of the table unoccupied. Judas is the fellow with the tarnished halo among the late arrivals at the left. The saint at the right is Beata Villana, a much revered Dominican nun. Here's another Annunciation. This is Cosimo de' Medici's cell with the adoration of the Magi on the wall. The Medici often identified themselves with the Magi as rich benefactors of the church. Here's the presentation in the temple with Peter Martyr, another Dominican saint at the lower left. His attribute is his bloody head. He was murdered by a radical heretic. The Transfiguration, Dominic is at the right here. His attribute is the star on his halo. Before she gave birth to him, his mother dreamt that she saw a star on his forehead. And here's Christ appearing to Mary Magdalene at the Resurrection. The former Pilgrim's Hospice at San Marco houses a museum containing many of the most important panel paintings by Fra Angelico. He painted some very large detailed tempera on wood panels, which are as one might expect, very different from his frescoes. And this is typical of pictures by artists who work in both media. The Sacra Conversazione we saw earlier is one example, and we'll see some others now. This is the altarpiece he painted for the monastery church at San Marco, which was commissioned by Cosimo de' Medici, who plays the role of his patron, Saint Cosmas, opposite Saint Damien in the foreground. 
Cosmas and Damien were doctors, i.e. Medici, giving them a clear connection to the family. This detail from the bottom of the picture could almost have been painted by one of Fra Angelico's Flemish contemporaries. And this is Cosimo de' Medici himself now, again, playing the role of St. Cosmas. And this is the Linaioli Tabernacle, which is on display there. This was painted for the same guild, the Linaioli, the second-hand clothes dealers, for which Donatello sculpted his St. Mark, which we saw last time in its Nichador San Michele. This is about the last time this format the Madonna enthroned was used by a major artist, and as we've seen, Fra Angelico had already used the by this time more au courant Sacra Conversazione format in the altarpiece for the Dominican convent at Fiesole. The angel musicians around the frame have been often reproduced. Here's one playing a rebec, a kind of ancestor of the violin. No bowed string instruments of the 15th century survive, so Pictures like this are useful to scholars trying to reproduce them. This is what a rebec sounds like. It's being played with a lute in this piece. This angel is playing a portative, that is, portable organ, the ancestor of the accordion. You may remember that this was Francesco Landini's favorite instrument. You can hear one being played now with uh, another rebec and a lute, a lute in the background. In the Uffizi Gallery, we can see Fra Angelico's Coronation of the Virgin, painted for the Church of San Egidio, which was attached to the Ospedale Santa Maria Nuova, founded by Folco Portinari, the father of Donnie's Beatrice, whom you should remember. This is the Santa Maria Nuova Hospital. Like the Linaioli Madonna, this is basically old-fashioned in conception. There's no real attention paid to perspective. Everyone just kind of floats above the clouds in a golden paradise. For a monk, Fra Angelico seems to be fascinated by fine clothes and handsome people, but I wouldn't jump to any conclusions about him from this. Fra Angelico puts a lot more detail also into his panel paintings than into his frescoes, as I suggested above, but this isn't unusual for painters who do both. Many Renaissance painters, in fact, seem to paint panels in a style that seems to have little in common with their fresco work. Here's a close-up of Mary Madeline in the foreground now. Last time we saw Donatello's version in which she was depicted as the ascetic evangelist of Gaul, but this is the more typical way to paint her, the blonde beauty. The story goes that someone once asked Fra Angelico where he, a Dominican monk who was supposed to keep his eyes on the ground and be unimpressed by feminine charm, might have seen the model for this subject. He's supposed to have answered that just because a man is on a diet, that doesn't mean he can't look at the menu. Angelico's most important panel painting is usually said to be the Strozzi altarpiece, which has the deposition as its subject. This was commissioned by the same family, the Strozzi, who commissioned the procession of the Magi by Gentili de Fabriano, which we saw earlier. This altarpiece was also for the Church of Santa Trinita and is now in the San Marco Museum. Palastrozzi, the head of the family, is thought to be at the right in blue, holding the crown of thorns and nails. <laughs> 
One of Pala's sons, either Alessio or Bartolomeo, both of whom had died before this was originally commissioned in 1425, is apparently the fellow in red kneeling in front of him. After Cosimo de' Medici returned from exile in 1434, many of his political enemies were banished, or worse, in their turn, and Pala and some other members of the Strozzi family were forced to leave Florence never to return themselves, although most historians think that Pala had in fact done nothing to deserve this. As a result, he may in fact have never seen this altarpiece. The original commission was for Lorenzo Monaco, but he died almost immediately and the project was then taken over and almost entirely redone by Fra Angelico, who didn't finish it until 1443. I made the point earlier that if your stage set is an outdoor one, to produce a 3D effect, what you really need to use is not geometrical or one-point perspective, but atmospheric perspective. Fra Angelico uses that very effectively in the landscape to the right of the cross here, changing the color of the rising landscape and the color of the sky, dark at the top, light at the horizon. He knew about and sometimes used one-point perspective also, but the city of Jerusalem at the left is not very convincing here. Maybe he thought it was far enough in the background, in the distance, that perspective didn't really matter. John Pope Hennessy thinks that the fellow in blue with a black turban behind the body of Christ is Michelazzo, the architect of San Marco in the Palazzo Medici that we'll see eventually. And there's another beautiful Mary Madeline at the feet of Jesus. Fra Angelico made at least two trips to Rome. He was there from around 1445 to 1450, and then again just before his death in 1455. Although much of what he did in Rome no longer survives, the frescoes he painted in the chapel of Nicholas V, one of which you see here, are very well preserved. Eugenius IV is supposed to have been so impressed by Fra Angelico as a person as well as as an artist, he wanted to make him the Archbishop of Florence. Fra Angelico turned this opportunity down, recommending in his stead Prior Antonino for the job, and whether or not on this recommendation Antonino did get it. In this picture we see St. Stephen, the proto-martyr, eventually stoned to death in the book of Acts, trying to convince the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. I always think of this as a real Italian scene. Italians, of course, are famous for talking with their hands, and here no one even bothers to open his mouth. It's all gesture. These are much more detailed and ornamented than his San Marco frescoes, but Eugenius and his successor Nicholas V, whose chapel this was, were not monks. Both were very worldly men and much interested in the arts. Here's another fresco in the Nicolene Chapel, which is incidentally easy to miss in the vast Vatican Palace. The entrance is from the Room of the Chiaroscuri near the Raphael Stanza. Here you can see Nicholas V himself playing the role of Saint Sixtus, creating Saint Lawrence a deacon. When Nicholas V, the Pope, was still just Tommaso Parenticelli, the Archbishop of Bologna, Cosimo de' Medici loaned him a lot of money. And when he became Pope, he transferred the Vatican account to the Medici Bank. Did Cosimo have some advanced knowledge that Parenticelli was going to become Nicholas V? I don't know, but just as you don't become a billionaire without stepping on some toes, you don't become one without some good luck and maybe some insider information now and then. This had a lot to do with keeping the Medici rich for the rest of the century, and certainly, at least indirectly, contributed to the success of the Florentine Renaissance. Fra Angelico died in Rome in 1455 and was buried in the Dominican church of Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, where his tomb can still be seen. There has been a kind of on-again, off-again movement to have him canonized, but until then he'll just have to be content as Angelico, if not Santo. <laughs>
modern statue of Filippo Brunelleschi showing him looking up at the dome he put on the Cathedral of Florence now. This is probably a decent likeness because we have not only a portrait of him by his son, but also his death mask, which the man who made this could use for models. We've heard about him uh, already, of course, in connection with the Baptistry Door competition, which he lost, in some sense, to Gaberti. I also mentioned that he and Donatello went to Rome, where Brunelleschi studied ancient buildings and where he must have spent, I think, a good deal of time in the Pantheon thinking of the dome he wanted to put on the Cathedral of Florence. If Brunelleschi had won the contest and spent the next 40 years of his life on the doors, he would have had no time to make the dome. It's just as well he lost. And he is also the man considered to have invented the technique of using one-point perspective to convincingly represent a three-dimensional world on a two-dimensional surface. He is much more well-known today as an architect than as a sculptor, but Vasari says that after Donatello made this crucifixion for Santa Croce, Brunelleschi criticized it and said that Donatello had made Jesus look like a peasant. Donatello snapped back that if he didn't like it, he should get a piece of wood and try to do a better one himself. Brunelleschi, Vasari says, took him up on this and carved a crucifix which is now across town in Santa Maria Novella. When he finished it, says Vasari, he invited Donatello to dinner, and when Donatello showed up, apparently having brought most of the dinner himself, pasta, tomatoes, cheese, wine, garlic, and so on, Brunelleschi opened the door, and when Donatello saw the crucifix that you see here now, his jaw dropped, his arms dropped, and the food all dropped right on the floor. He admitted that, indeed, Brunelleschi had much improved on his own work. Donatello was known to be generous and self-effacing, as I've said, but this is a peculiar story. If Brunelleschi's complaint was that Donatello's version was peasant-like, not noble and idealized enough, his own treatment hardly seems to satisfy these criteria either. This is, in fact, an unusual treatment of the subject for the Italian Renaissance. It's virtually unprecedented to do Christ on the cross in the nude, and this is not an idealized nude of the sort favored by Italian artists. It has more the gruesome realism about it of something done in Germany or maybe Spain. In any case, interesting as his career might have been if he'd stuck to sculpture, his passion was for architecture. The Cathedral of Florence was begun by Arnolfo de Cambio in 1296. It wasn't actually finished until the façade was erected in the 1880s. After Arnolfo's death, Giotto was named nominal capomastro, but probably did little but design the campanile. Francesco Teleni took over the work in the mid-14th century, and by 1366 the nave had been vaulted. But although Arnolfo's original plan apparently called for the crossing to be domed, it was unclear how to accomplish this. In 1367, Nere de Fioravante, who had erected the 60-foot wide vault in the Great Hall of the Bargello, drew up plans for a 143-foot wide dome and made a large model of this which stood on display in the church like a challenge to his successors for the next half century. And after 1400, when, as I said, consumer confidence and general optimism were on the rise in Florence, an attempt was made by the wool guild, the Arte Delana, which had financial responsibility for the church, to find a way to engineer the dome. And all sorts of architects and experts of one kind or another were interviewed, plans were drawn up and discussed, models made, and so on. But all the potential builders wanted things like big insurance policies, except Brunelleschi, who had essentially nothing but supreme self-confidence to put on his resume. He did build two very small domes and a couple of chapels, but that wasn't much experience for a man who wanted to build something the like of which hadn't been attempted in a thousand years. Here's the dome from the air now. 
Apart from his confidence, Brunelleschi also had on his side the fact that he claimed to be able to build the dome without putting up a 30-story wooden building inside the church to serve as a scaffold and centering while the dome was under construction. This would be not only elegant, but maybe more important, it would be cheap. Brunelleschi complicated matters, however, by apparently refusing to show anyone his model or blueprints and exactly how he was put in charge of the project is a complicated story. Vasari says that one day, when the experts were all arguing about how to do the job, Brunelleschi proposed that anyone clever enough to make an egg stand on in should be appointed architect. Amazingly, the others agreed, but none could do it. Brunelleschi then took the egg and just scrunched it down on the tabletop to make it stand up. The others all said, oh well, I could have done that. To which Brunelleschi answered, that's what you'll say when you see my plans for the dome. Oh, I could have done that. The point is that coming up with a good idea is a much different thing than recognizing one that's presented to you. Here in the Cathedral Museum, you can see one of the models Brunelleschi made. Apparently, the only fellow who was by this time being considered as a serious alternative to Brunelleschi was, of all things, Lorenzo Ghiberti, who had never built anything in his life and had apparently submitted an unoriginal and in all likelihood unworkable plan that required elaborate scaffolding besides. But he was regarded as the preeminent genius in Florence. On the basis of his work on the doors, and during the Renaissance, genius was often treated as a kind of magical property that could be poured into any project. And sure enough, in 1420, he and Ghiberti were awarded the project as joint capomastri. It was the baptistry door competition all over again, although this time Brunelleschi certainly did not give up. The actual design chosen was Brunelleschi's, but for six years Ghiberti was to be a thorn in his side until, as Vasari tells the story, Brunelleschi pretended to be sick, so Ghiberti would have to take charge of the work and expose his incapacity. Ghiberti continued to collect a salary in any case for an indeterminate amount of time, but more and more it became clear that the dome belonged to Brunelleschi, despite the fact that in his autobiography, Ghiberti singles it out as one of his chief accomplishments. Building the dome involved Brunelleschi in all sorts of engineering work, building hoists and cranes and making tools of one sort or another. His biographer Manetti says he personally inspected every brick used, but it has four million, so someone else may, I think, have served occasionally as chief brick inspector. The so-called chains that are said by early writers to have been used to support the dome have puzzled modern commentators. Certainly no metal chains are still there. Stone rings of some kind may have been planned but were apparently not executed. The first stone of the lantern on the top was placed by Archbishop Antonino in 1446, shortly before Brunelleschi's death, by which the dome of course had been finished. And the ball on top wasn't added until 1471. It fell off in 1492 and was, re was replaced by the one we see now. Ross King, in a recent book about the dome, calls this the widest masonry dome ever. But that's puzzling because the usual figures given put it third behind the Pantheon and the Dome of St. Peter's. All are usually said to be around 140 feet wide. Here's the cathedral from the front now. The facade, remember, is 19th century. The church was consecrated on the Feast of the Annunciation, March 25, 1436, with Eugenius IV officiating and everyone who was anyone in attendance. Guillaume Dufay wrote the consecration motet, Nuper Rosarum Flores, for the occasion, and we'll hear some of it now while we see a little bit more of the building in detail. Cosimo de Medici's 
biographer, librarian, Vespasiano da Bastici, was present at the consecration of the cathedral. Here's part of what he has to say. Along the gallery came the Pope and all the court of Rome, the Pope in full pontificals and mitre, all the cardinals in their finest copes, the bishops who were also cardinals in damask mitres, with the cross borne before them according to pontifical usage, the apostolic subdeacons in their regular surplices, and the whole court of Rome duly arrayed. Round the altar had been contrived a fine level space covered with carpet, where were stationed the College of Cardinals and the Prelates. The Pope's seat was covered with damask of white and gold. The Pope said the Pontifical Mass in due order, and the ceremony was of the finest. This is a detail of one of the small semi-domes supporting the drum. A detail in one of the drum windows. Looking up at the dome from inside, it was painted by Vasari's company in the 16th century. Ghiberti did design the stained glass windows of the drum. This is the agony in the garden. Here you are between the inner and outer walls of the dome. This is the interior of the lantern now looking up. It used to be that you could actually climb up a rope ladder into the ball itself. The lantern from outside. And the whole church. <laughs> 
that's where we'll take the break, after which we'll see what else Brunelleschi did in Florence and see the Palazzo Medici also, for which his plans were rejected.